So the way this works is you've been saving your questions all day, haven't you? All right. There's two microphones. If you want to get up and stand up and talk into the microphones and ask your questions, do that. Otherwise, I'm going to make every single one of these dudes and ladies um, introduce themselves um, and tell you what they're working on. So please um, don't be um, shy. Come and ask the, any question. This is an AMA, so this is your opportunities here. So, all right. Go ahead. And otherwise, Joe's going to talk. All right, so while our team's getting up here, uh, my name's Joe Fernandes. Uh, I uh, run the core platform team for OpenShift. I also now am in charge of OpenShift and Red Hat Virtualization. We have here a large group. These are our OpenShift product managers, uh, as well as our uh, members of our OpenShift engineering team, lead architects and uh, managers. Um, we're here to answer your questions, not only today, but throughout the week. So I know many of you guys have uh, uh, meetings scheduled in the customer briefing center. We have uh, a few hundred OpenShift uh, customer meetings set up. Um, a lot of interesting things going on. So, uh, so obviously you've heard about some of it today. Um, before we do this, I wanted to actually thank all of our customer presenters today. It was amazing to, to hear all these stories. So big round of applause. Also want to thank our partners, Microsoft, VMware, all the other partners who presented and who uh, sponsored the event. So thank you to them. And with that, uh, if you have a question, either stand at a mic or raise your hand, and uh, Diane will find you. Uh, and uh, we'll kick it off. All right. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you for today. Um, my question is, based on earlier presentation with uh, channels and some of the earlier roadmap, was OpenShift 4.0 actually skipped and we're getting straight into 4.1 being the stable release? Yeah. <laughs> yep, Clayton Coleman. So, so earlier Mike talked about us being courageous to change things. <laughs> so we know that nobody ever installs a 0 .0 release <laughs> and so we had the courage to go straight to 4.1. <laughs> and, and part of that was keeping the internal um, timeline moving, which is we actually had an internal 4.0, and 4.1 is um, a set of features that were always actually plotted for 4.1, and so we did a 4.0, and then we decided to soak and hold it longer. Yeah, so the version number for the first GA will be 4.1. You should expect that to be available in the next, uh, about two weeks from now, uh, in the channel. Uh, the beta that many of you guys have participated in, that was uh, 4.0, and um, and then uh, after 4.1, we're going to get back on our you know, releasing every three to four month cadence. So 4.2 should be end of August, uh, September. We're trying to get a 4.3 out uh, around the end of the year. Um, and, um, and then you'll see that, you know, continue that into the new year. So, all right. OK, so I have a question regarding uh, your plans uh, in terms of uh, development of CICD features, specifically what would happen with Jenkins. I'm not sure what your experience is about this specific thing, but we are not quite happy, and we would like to get some feedback from you on where to invest, what is the direction. Cool. Um, I'll let William talk to this. And can talk a little bit about that. So regarding Jenkins, for the foreseeable future, we'll still work with Jenkins, but we are also working with Tecton as one of the CI-CD technologies that we want to deploy as part of the OpenShift pipeline story. Uh, not sure if that answers your question or if we had something more specific regarding Jenkins. Yeah, and so Tecton is a new upstream project around building a cloud native uh, or Kubernetes native CI CD capabilities uh, right into the tool. So that's, that's a project that we're uh, really excited about, really investing in. Um, we've been shipping Jenkins uh, since, since the start. Um, a lot of customers are using it. The other thing I remind customers is there's a ton of choice in this area, right? There's so many different CI CD tools and so forth. And so you're not limited just to the, you know, the tools that we ship. Uh, most customers are, are bringing their own tooling, whether that's Jenkins or Bamboo or TeamCity or GitLab, um, you know, all sorts of, of different tools and so forth. And so what we're really trying to do is make sure that we can nicely integrate regardless of what you're choosing for CI and CD services. But if you want to know the direction of where we're going, uh, check out the Tecton uh, project um, and, um, 
and you know that, that's I think we'll you'll see a lot of uh, what we're where we're headed uh, through that. Cool. So. Yeah, uh, I couldn't attend the morning session, so I'm not sure if this question is answered this morning or not. Um, is there going to be migration path from 3.11 to 4.1 or 2, or it's a net new install and we have to reinstall all the apps and all? Okay. So go ahead, Maria. So hi, I'm Maria Bracha. Uh, we're working on a tool to migrate for uh, applications from 3.11 uh, to 4. And this is an app migration tool leveraging the upstream project called Valero, which is the previously Heptier Arc. Okay. Right. So that will be supported by Red Hat, right? That will be supported by Red Hat, right? Okay. Yeah, and so also I know some folks lived through the V2 to V3. So obviously V2 to V3, we changed everything, right? We completely rebuilt the platform, uh, moved everything to Kubernetes and containers. So there was no easy way to automate that migration. but. V3 to V4, it's a Kubernetes platform. It's the same containers. All the, you know, everything that you're doing on V3 should work in V4 because the innovation is all around how we operate the platform and services on that platform. Um, as Maria mentioned, uh, there's a, an OpenShift migration tool, which Maria is the PM for, so uh, feel free to uh, ping her later, but it's going to allow you to automate sort of the, um, you know, the migration of 3x apps onto 4x and so forth. Um, it's not in place, it's not an upgrade, it's a migration. Uh, and then we're already working with a number of customers who have large deployments to uh, kind of figure out what, what, what else we need to do there to And to one more plug change. for that, yeah. uh, we're gonna be demoing that tomorrow as part of the OpenShift uh, What's oh, New. That's right, actually there's an OpenShift roadmap session? Or? Yeah, so there's, actually we're repeating that session twice. I know last year some people couldn't get into the OpenShift roadmap session, so the OpenShift roadmap session will be it should be on the agenda two times. Uh, we'll be demoing the migration tools uh, in that session. All the good sessions are full, so. You know, <laughs> all right, and then all those sessions are recorded and will be available uh, shortly after the, after the conference. So. Okay, another question. So the OpenShift as a SaaS offering in Azure, uh, is there any timeline on that? Uh, OpenShift dedicated in Azure? You want to talk about Managed yeah. service. Uh, managed service, yeah. Yeah, so Azure Red Hat OpenShift um, is actually going to be announced um, Tomorrow? Tomorrow, yeah. I didn't okay. know if I could actually say it, but yeah, yeah, it'll be announced tomorrow and it'll be available tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'll actually jump back to that last question just a little. Hi, I'm Eric Paris, one of the architects. On, we discussed kind of the tool that we're gonna help to migrate applications from three to four, right? But why we did that, why? I'm sure a lot of people are wondering why did we not provide that upgrade path. And it's because what Joe mentioned, the operational characteristics of everything is completely different. It's completely different, right? The way that you configure the cluster and run the cluster. And we had more concern about trying to create an upgrade path from three to four that would actually break your cluster and leave you in a state that was difficult to recover than we thought it would be for customers to have a second cluster that they were able to get up and get running and understand the new operational ways to interact with OpenShift 4, and then you can move your applications bit by bit from one to the other. And that application migration tool they mentioned is generally useful, and we'd actually, it's been a common request for quite a long time to make sure that there's a path um, so that applications can move more seamlessly between clusters. So rather than double down on something that had that higher risk profile, trying to make sure that we could actually uh, ensure you have a successful 4.1 launch, but also spend that time invested in tools that actually help you move yeah. between clusters has uh, more benefit in the long run. And between 4.1 well, clusters or th older 3x clusters and 4x clusters, so. Exactly, actually that, that's a good point that Clay, Clay Starting mentioned. on 3.7, and yeah. that's actually so, a key point. So the migration tool isn't just gonna be uh, helpful for three to four migrations, it'll also be helpful for four to four migrations for customers who can't uh, upgrade to every single release. Like let's say you have to go multiple releases. Kubernetes forces you to go sequential. That's not the, the, the norm for a lot of customers. And so I think that'll actually help us even beyond uh, the three to four migrations. So okay. one more question over, here. question over here. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> um, there are different opinions in the internet um, uh, concerning um, OpenShift deployment. Uh, um, what is the best practice uh, deployment, uh, OpenShift deployment on bare metal or virtual machines? All right. Well, I can start and anybody else can weigh in. Um, so, I mean, 
the thing with OpenShift is we want to make sure that it serves as a common abstraction regardless of your choice of infrastructure. So the answer, it should run as well on bare metal as it does on VMware, as it does on OpenStack, as it does on Amazon, on Azure, on Google, because ultimately the only way we're going to succeed is if we can give you a rock solid consistent abstraction layer for your applications and then allow you to run that across different infrastructures based on what matters to you, whether that's cost or location or you know, whatever decision. Um, you know, I, I think that um, that's been our focus. And you know, with Forex, we're trying to make it easy to operate the platform uh, across different environments, right? And obviously, one of the things you lose when you go to bare metal um, is you lose a lot of the automation of your virtualized environment, automated uh, compute provisioning, automated storage and networking and so forth. Um, Check out the keynote demo uh, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we're gonna show what we've been doing to bring a cloud-like experience to bare metal so that operating a bare metal cluster um, has all the same or uh, similar characteristics to operating on a virtualized environment. But then at the end of the day, the choice is yours uh, as to where you wanna run it. And many customers here in the room and uh, you know, in our customer base are running it in multiple environments and obviously that's great for us because that means that we're really um, you know, living up to this uh, mission of, of being a hybrid cloud solution. Yeah, I, would, I would add a lot of the thing, a lot of the benefits that we see in the long run. Um, virtualization has a lot of advantages and um, running on bare metal has a lot of advantages. And so for us, um, we think Red Hat more than anyone else is actually really well positioned to run on all the world's hardware uh, with Linux and uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and CoreOS, uh, Red, RHEL CoreOS actually, um, takes all of the strengths of the RHEL hardware certification and means we can do in-place cluster upgrades and some of this automated management. So a lot of the investments we're making in 4X um, play equally well on virtualization or bare metal, but in a bare metal environment, we think it'll be an experience that's better than hypervisors. Yeah, I would only add that um, it's very rare that a customer only has one infrastructure these days. They have multiple clouds or investments. Um, the highest population of growth we're seeing is in the bare metal. So it may be a smaller population, but its growth rate is, is faster than some of the other uh, infrastructures out there. Uh, Joe mentioned this keynote tomorrow. Uh, so Red Hat's in an unusual situation where we're very strong in infrastructure, right? We have our open stack investments. We have engineers and kernel engineers that talk to service processors and how to bring up networks. So you'll see in this uh, keynote demo this culmination of a lot of different skill sets at Red Hat coming together and what we think the future will look like in bare metal. Okay. Cool. If I may, the second question uh, in the same direction. Um, Walker, uh, Walker nodes uh, with different computing. This is best practice? Uh, Walker nodes with different compute? Uh, for example, uh, um, a memory or a CPU. Yeah. So, uh, Derek showed this morning something cool that people may not realize. It's called machine sets. Um, and um, so when you bring up that initial cluster, we want to make that super fast, right? So it'll, it'll bring up a highly available uh, set of uh, worker nodes. So three work, uh, sorry, uh, uh, controller nodes. So three, uh, three masters, um, three compute nodes, kind of all configured the same. Uh, but then you can actually bring up machine sets. I don't know, you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah, I just customers. want to make sure I understood your question fully. So. Um, are you saying like uh, you don't have a homogenous fleet? You have some com some some computers with different CPU counts and memory capabilities than others. Yeah. So I mean, that that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, I mean, my background in the upstream is largely around resource management, so I spent a lot of time in Kubernetes to make that possible for you. So I would say you should be successful in having a, a heterogeneous uh, pools of compute in four. Uh, X, I think we're doing more to make that easier. So um, while Joe talked about how we're doing work, if you're on particular cloud environments to make it easier to provision and deprovision compute, that could vary on characteristics. Uh, that, that's an option, but we also have um, the ability to, or what I would aspire for the ability is that you could have different configuration for like accelerated instances versus normal worker instances, and you should be able to tweak how you configure that host differently. The, another capability we have that was not highlighted too closely was there's a node tuning operator. So uh, depending on how you label your nodes, you can actually have an operator that applies tuned profiles to those hosts for you automatically. So 
I guess from my perspective, we're doing a lot to try to make it possible to run heterogeneous node pools without issue, and we'll continue to invest in making it easier to make the system smarter on configuring that. The, the only thing you might want to do is just change your system reservations for each node pool. Yeah, but and where, where I was it. going with machine sets is, you know, sometimes you want to actually have specific hardware for specific services, specific applications. So now you can actually create, um, you know, different yeah. pools of compute so, that are optimized differently for like, so these are my machines that run storage, these are my machines that run heavy AI processes, these are GPU enabled and so forth. Um, and kind of tying that uh, even directly to operators and stuff is something that we're... Uh, yeah. so, so you can define different pools of compute and then you could target workloads to those pools. So if you had like a, a GPU accelerated instance in a cloud and you wanted to dynamically auto scale just that set, like the Forex capabilities that we have should make that like super easy to do. Um, and so, yeah, you should be fine. Cool. Thank you very much. Cool. All right. Uh, hello. Uh, so my question's more about um, cloud capabilities. So uh, the feature sets at least seem to overlap a lot or converging a lot. So for things like Knative versus uh, AWS Lambda or AWS Kubernetes services versus uh, your own platform. So in the future, where do you guys see the platform going in order to uh, differentiate yourselves relative to just going to native services? Yeah. So look, we've been competing with native services since we launched OpenShift 3, right? Like OpenShift 3 and GKE pretty much launched uh, around the same time, right? Um, I think uh, on the, and, and so now, you know, four years later, there's I think over 80, you know, CNCF conformant Kubernetes distributions. Um, you know, we're gonna uh, do two things in my mind and I'll let others uh, chime in. One is we're gonna continue focusing on making it the best platform for Kubernetes and for hybrid cloud, right? And um, you see a particular focus on 4X where we see a lot of the challenges still in Kubernetes, which is how to operate that platform seamlessly, particularly across a hybrid environment. Um, and even as um, now some of the cloud providers like Amazon and Google realize that we live in a hybrid world uh, and they're coming on premise, um, it, it may be some time before you see Amazon support you on Azure or Google support you <laughs> on Amazon, right? Um, so for us, a hybrid cloud isn't just one cloud provider and an on-premise appliance. It's being able to work across all the major clouds, being work, able to work across different on-premise footprints, whether that's bare metal, OpenStack, VMware, what have you, um, and being able to operate at the edge, right? So, so building the best hybrid cloud, hybrid Kubernetes platform is one area where we think we already have huge advantage and we're gonna to continue to differentiate ourselves. Um, the next, the other area is all the stuff we're building on top of the platform. So Knative, you mentioned the work we're doing on Istio, the work we're doing on CICD services, the work we're doing on the developer experience with our middleware team, um, frankly with the, 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 the teams, our partners and so forth, um, to sort of build a really rich um, set of services and capabilities for end users to drive consumption of that platform. So I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything. So I think like in the long run, we're not gonna be using any one thing. We're gonna be using all the things. Like no, no technology advance in the history of technology has removed the previous technology. We just layer more stuff on top. And I think some of what we're trying to do is um, make sure there's a healthy open source ecosystem that can support people wherever they are, whatever cloud provider, whatever hardware they have. Um, there'll always be trade-offs in picking you know, well-designed services from a particular provider. And um, we did that for a really long time. Uh, with Microsoft, we did that for a really long time with IBM and other companies before that. Um, there'll always be a best of breed technology that you may or may not make trade-offs to use directly. I think in general, we just see that it's, there'll always be more than just that one best of breed technology. And so what we're focused on is making sure that the delta between that best of breed technology and open source and open platforms is as small as possible by investing in you know, standard operational environments, standard application environments, you know, building out open source communities that complement or supplement um, what you know, uh, proprietary vendors um, don't provide. Yeah, and we know wherever that innovation comes from, it's gonna come from open source, right? And you know, that's obviously aligned with what Red Hat's good at, right? And then everything from our investments all the way down to the kernel and the infrastructure up to middleware and application services, I think gives us good breadth of 
kind of expertise and capabilities to to continue to differentiate. So yeah, and we I mean we love it, right? We love having so many different Kubernetes uh, investments from different vendors, right? I mean, go to Indeed and do a job search. There's a lot of protection on this technology package that you're all involved in in this room. And think of the opposite. Think of if it was just us, right? So we 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 encourage the cooperation. We encourage yeah, the competition. Exactly. It's a great uh, sort of place yeah. to be. Thank you. Hi there. I just uh, wanted to ask if you guys expect to have the developer preview updated to support non AWS installs, specifically like physical servers or anything. Yeah, so actually if you go out to try.openshift.com right now, as of uh, Friday, it actually enables you to go on-premise so you can try out uh, bare metal and vSphere at this point. Oh, sweet, right. thank you. So yeah, so we, we, we started with AWS. Beta 4 has uh, bare metal and vSphere. Uh, we also have been working with Microsoft on the Azure um, uh, provider, which will be available soon. Uh, the GCP, the Google Cloud Platform, and OpenStack Platform are, are both far along. Uh, those are also targeted. Um, so again, you know, what we're focused on in OpenShift 4 is extending our automation all the way down into the infrastructure. But you know, all that infrastructure is different. So we've been, we have to do specific work on each infrastructure to automate the you know, provisioning of those compute resources, the networking, the storage, and so forth. Um, but in return, what you get is you know, less work, more automation, more, more goodies that you can take advantage of, not only when you install, but also when you do upgrades, and also having the cluster be able to scale capacity up and down. You know, and if, if I had a nickel for every time a customer asked me if they could auto-scale their nodes over the last eight years, <laughs> I'd be a rich man. We, you can do that now, and that, that's, um, that's part of what we're doing. So check that out, and um, you know, Give us your feedback. Oh, definitely. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey. Yeah, so I have a question regarding operators. Um, if we assume we have like the perfect level five operator that has all the knowledge about operating a, a component codified and you know is prepared to handle everything except for the one thing it's not prepared to handle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously, yeah, I mean, operators take a lot of responsibility away from the operator of that component, but leaves the last 1% of responsibility still there because he needs to be able to react onto any, for, for anything that might happen. Now, do you have any ideas of, of, or even you might be working on stuff that, you know, that makes that process of, of bringing the analysis of what's, what's happening, what's the, what's the problem to, I guess it involves people, it supports specialists, and how, to, how we can close that last gap? Yeah, great question. Um, in general, you want to build an operator so that it's defensive uh, in nature, and then you know it's going to fail safely as much as possible. So that's like kind of the foundation of this. And then we want to build in other ways of bubbling up status from the uh, SDK and our scaffolding um, up to users and admins, and then all the way into that metering component where you're actually getting operational metrics around for some reason, this database that's being managed over here has hit some weird situation. Either needs to be escalated to the operator author or at least the cluster admin, something like that. So it's kind of like a multi-pronged approach there. Um, but we're going to be, you know, moving a lot of innovation in the SDK forward really quickly on that type of thing. And I'll, I'll follow up as well as like at the platform level. Derek alluded a little bit to this this morning. Is um, opt-in with customers in the same way that we've worked to do insights for Red Hat systems before. Is we want to actually help. You know, at the end of the day, everybody on this stage, everybody at Red Hat is there to ensure that your software keeps running. And so we want to do a better job of both delivering software to you, enabling our ISVs and partners to deliver software, helping train them. But there'll always be some percentage of cases that, just like all software, it's not perfect. Um, we want to make sure that there's actually a great channel between um, the platform and Red Hat's support to um, make case resolution faster, to um, help us collect data from the fleet when customers opt in to share that, to give you access to early um, drops of the software so that we can get advance notice. You know, we've tossed around some ideas over the last um, year or so about you know, making it easy to get new versions of the kernel that people can test on bare metal, right? That's part of that story around how do we do bare metal better. It's about ensuring that um, we're working with customers and users to make the software better 
And that might mean you know, sharing some data with Red Hat, sharing faults with Red Hat in a way that we can take that, turn it around, and so the support team is better armed to answer questions about your environment. And we'll, we'll talk more about this over the, the coming year. And it'll always be opt-in, of course, because um, you know, earning customer trust is pretty critical to us. So I, I would add one other thing, and we didn't get to touch on this very much, but even our own experience in four, we you talk about operators as autopilot. Well, sometimes you still want to turn autopilot off and take control. And so um, uh, there are areas where we uh, have recognized that we haven't yet had the operational experience to operate as optimally as we like, and we've steered away from that. And so I would say if there are areas when you're writing your own operators that give you concern, like, listen to that. And, um, uh, and if you do try to experiment with it, make sure that you can uh, turn it off or override it in case bad actually happens, right? The worst thing would be if you're just constantly fighting with your operator. <laughs> um, and so I, I would just like give that advice based on our own experience in, in the four development cycle is, uh, um, as uh, Rob said, always think about failure modes, always ensure you could turn it off if it's not working for you, and um, try to keep them simple, honestly. Yeah. Also, at level six, the operators become sentient, so be careful. <laughs> careful. <laughs> yeah, sounds interesting. Thanks a lot, guys. Hi, uh, I have a question about uh, auto scaling. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> as of now, we were uh, able to auto scale the, our cloud resources. Uh, I'm not talking about the uh, power auto scaling. In fact, you know, I'm talking about the no auto scaling. On the cloud, uh, we would write our own launch configuration and then uh, specify the uh, auto scaling there, but how uh, are we uh, have do, do we have any plans of extending that to the VMware or maybe uh, on prem in future? Um, yeah, so as Joe said, we want to the, the API service we presented today, if you look under the covers, is very focused on describing the characteristics of the compute you want to bring up and tear down, and we've not much else. Um, so the set of platforms we can support for that will come over time. Um, once that API is available, any of those uh, platforms should be able to take advantage of, of auto scaling. Um, so we have a resource that we didn't show called just a machine auto scaler resource. And you say, OK, I want to scale this pool of compute within this bounding range. Um, and once we have support for each platform, and probably you should talk to a PM about priority and ordering, um, it, it should work the same everywhere uh, and, and work well. Now, I think you also mentioned on-prem, right? And so some of the stuff you'll see in the keynote that they're talking about, they aren't going to show auto-scaling. Um, but it is something that has been considered. How can we, um, during low usage, actually power off machines? Right, you've got real hardware, we can power it off, we can power it back on. The same way in the cloud, you would be able to just get new instances. We are trying to figure out how to apply the same auto scaler um, to bare metal, right, to on-prem as well. Um, so that story, as Derek said, is not just uh, as we bring clouds on board, we're trying to bring it into the data center as well. It can also be at the, uh, the VM layer too, right? Sure. I mean, so just to be clear, right, we're not talking about just public cloud, we're talking about also on-prem, so if you had like yeah. VMware or something like that. Yeah, so. I mean, what the cloud does is obviously make it more convenient, right? There's more APIs that we can call into to, to scale up, compute, and configure everything else. But those, a those APIs exist in the virtualization platform and we're building automation around even bare metal uh, because we want to make that compute dynamically uh, scalable, regardless, again, of what infrastructure you choose to run on. So, so uh, by, de by default, uh, Kubernetes uh, recommend for us to go with an uh, uh, odd number of master nodes. And uh, is that, are we breaking that silos from all, all OpenShift point of view? I think in the short term, you're going to find we're going to be pretty opinionated about what the control plane looks like. So we're probably going to support three masters. <laughs> And um, part of that is um, we want to make sure, so, uh, and actually Derek did not get to this in his talk, if you want to talk, or Alex, if you want to talk about the etcd operator. Um, we do want to bring um, control planes uh, deeper under control of the plat platform, and we don't want to expose too much flexibility now, because that would prevent us from doing that later. 
Yeah, to answer the immediate question, the reason we recommend the odd number is because etcd uh, needs an odd number of nodes to operate optimally. You can operate successfully with an even number, but you lose performance that way. So in the interest of conserving resources, we just scale the uh, control plane to be the exact same size. Um, in the future, uh, the plan is to eventually allow the control plane to auto scale as well. Um, that work is underway. Um, and I don't think we have anything to announce about that now, but keep your eyes out. <laughs> the longer term trend is really, we don't want to force you to have to make operational choices that are meaningless to your success. We want you to focus on the, cho the choices that make a difference, the workload scaling, hardware certification, um, network configuration, choices, choices that actually do matter. And as much as possible, we would like the control plane to be transparent, seamless, automatic, and if it breaks, it's our problem, not yours. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you as it relates to the conversion of going from converged infrastructure to hyper-converged infrastructure. I was talking to my Nutanix guys, and at one point in time, the Red Hat OCP team was talking to Nutanix, and some of us are trying to decide, you know, as we do our, our on-prem hardware selections as we move forward, where they're gonna be. It seemed to stop when the IBM purchase started, or was there another reason before that as it related to Nutanix? No, so, so first of all, we have OpenShift customers running uh, on Nutanix. We have OpenShift customers running on VMware, OpenStack, and on other platforms. The thing is, is that um, certain, there's platforms that you know where RHEL is certified, where we actually have a relationship with the partners that we can actually jointly troubleshoot all the way down to the OS and its integration with the infrastructure. And then there's platforms where we don't have that relationship or we don't have that level of integration. Uh, Nutanix is, is one of those. Uh, so it is sort of a, like a demarcation line between, you know, you know, what you'd come to Red Hat for and then what we'd ask you to uh, sort of either reproduce or help us sort of engage uh, the Nutanix side. But um, that's actually has not changed at all, you know, in the last, since the beginning of OpenShift and so forth. That's kind of, um, so it really has nothing to do with the IBM acquisition. It just has to do with, uh, you know, each provider's kind of integration, uh, both from a technology as well as from a partner perspective with, with Red Hat and, and our, our joint engineering efforts. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, my question is on observability uh, capabilities. As I understand, like OpenShift, you know, Kubernetes, or Istio has different level of observability, and the operative operator metering, I understand, is also uh, you know, level of observability that you're providing. Is there a plan to consolidate and provide a kind of a, you know, a unified view? So within the console, uh, there is absolutely the already work underway to give you kind of the snapshot view of everything that's kind of happening in the cluster uh, at a given time. That being said, with certain things like Istio specifically, you know, you may end up with a lot of uh, observability data that actually could give a, an individual with malicious intent more kind of understanding of your application that you want just anybody on the cluster to have. So there, there is actually good reason why certain components here are segmented in such a way where it's not just a big picture view where you see kind of everything all at once and why there is a lot more nuance to the views in which those are presented. So I think it really just comes down to is there security concerns about exposing that data to a more general audience of cluster users that really kind of defines when you will see big picture things and when you get a really deep drill down. Uh, uh, like, do we have plans to implement maybe, you know, role-based authentication or something like that to, to have the drill down capabilities? So there's a, there's a number of items underway to um, allow the monitoring on the platform to more closely integrate with the UI. There is some role-based access to that. Segregation of certain um, metrics are visible in the console. I don't think we're gonna get quite as sophisticated um, around that aspect um, until, you know, in the, I would say, until Istio is a normal part of every cluster, um, we actually wanna focus on making sure that 
the security boundaries are respected, that the, the core is stable, that applications work well, that we have the first and second levels of integration with Kubernetes concepts like ingresses and routes and services. And then I think you'll see more investment in that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, one last question. Thank you. No. Uh, <laughs> is, is Theo part of 4.0? I missed this morning's session. Uh, I don't know. Yes. Thank you. No. Well, no four, it's four. Well, four dot x. Four, four, no, four one, which is the initial GA release. Sorry, this project for that confusion. So the four one, which is coming out in two weeks, Istio will uh, go GA on four one. So, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, in the morning demonstration of OpenShift four, we could see a feature where you could remotely see your clusters and which versions they were running. Um, I have two questions about that feature. The first question is, will that uh, portal enable you to remotely trigger an upgrade in that cluster? And the second question is whether this feature will be available for partners that resell OpenShift to customers. Yeah, so, so what you're, you're referring to uh, is, uh, it's gonna be at uh, cloud.redhat.com. It's our uh, OpenShift uh, uh, cloud manager or cluster manager. Um, and so yeah, it, the whole uh, idea is to allow you to remotely uh, register running clusters, launch the installer to provision new clusters, and then actually be able to uh, see what versions uh, you know each of your clusters is running um, so that you can sort of uh, decide when to upgrade and to trigger that upgrade. Um, it, uh, it is a hosted service. Um, it leverages telemetry that's in the cluster to, to send information back. Um, obviously, if you're, it's optional, so if you're in a disconnected environment or offline mode, um, you, know, you, you wouldn't use that. Um, but if you're in a connected environment, uh, it allows us to keep tabs on it. Um, we are also um, uh, looking at how can we take that capability for those offline customers and package that as something that we could deliver uh, for you to run in your own data center. It's all architected, it actually runs on OpenShift, it's architected as containers, so that's something to uh, kind of look ahead to, Not, but in, initially it'll be available as a hosted service. Um, and yeah, we're very open to, we don't have anything to announce today, but we're very open to talking to partners about how you can kind of have, um, if you're a partner that's um, delivering OpenShift as a service to your customers, um, you know, again, no concrete plans to, to announce today, but that's something that we want to discuss with partners about, you know, what's, what's the best way? Is it just to use the same service that we use and, you know, maybe have some branding or whatever, or is it uh, better to deploy your own instance of that once we have it as a deployable thing? Uh, those decisions haven't been made yet, but that's kind of, you know, those are things that we're you know, exploring and so forth and would love uh, your feedback. Thank yeah. you. Just uh, really quick to add to that. So um, with OpenShift dedicated, uh, basically the clusters that we have that Red Hat is managing, you will be able to remotely trigger upgrade for those clusters. For uh, OCP clusters that are you know self-installed that you're managing, um, that's a it's a feature we're looking at right now. Um, but at the moment, yeah, you won't be able to uh, trigger remotely trigger upgrades for OCP clusters yet. Yeah, uh, uh, the scenario is a uh, CCSP provider that sells clusters to to you know to other customers and. That feature will allow you to keep a tab of what's happening, where, what the customer is doing in the case that the customer decides to manage themselves, the, the, the cluster. So you can say, you know what, you are on a version that has uh, critical security features, you should upgrade as soon as possible, et cetera. So it would allow the CCSP provider to better service their customer. That's the scenario. Yeah, it, it's a great idea. And again, the, the implementation is something that we need to discuss with partners like yourself in terms of you know, again, tying into the infrastructure that we have in place for uh, cloud.redhat.com or, you know, deploying multiple instances of that. It's just, uh, I think today we have, to, uh, we, have to, we have to do more digging and more, have more conversations to figure out, you know, what's gonna work out best for us and for our partners. Okay. So. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, first I wanna address the gentleman who had asked a question about uh, IBM's acquisition having anything to do with <laughs> your plans on Nutanix. Um, we would very much like uh, Nutanix to be supported as well. I mean, I represent the power systems. We have a Nutanix offering on power as well. Um, so, so I just want to kind of dispel that notion. 
Uh, moving on to, to my question, which is we do get some feedback from our clients that they'd like to mix different architectures. They want to put workloads appropriately or, or place you know, appropriate workloads on the right architecture mm -hmm. um, in specific to Nutanix as well and in general. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see a roadmap where you can mix uh, architectures in a yeah, so, so, OpenShift cluster? Yeah, so, so today, you know, I see predominantly where OpenShift runs is x86 architecture. Uh, we do have support for OpenShift on IBM Power. Uh, and we have uh, an entire team called the multi-arch team that's kind of focused on, you know, multi-arch capabilities, not just for power, uh, but for um, exploring things like ARM, uh, Z even, and so forth. Um, we think this is an area, again, can't really say anything about the acquisition until the acquisition closes, but, you know, it's an area with, you know, today with IBM as a partner and, and down the road that we look to kind of collaborate more on uh, for the architectures that they care about. But yeah, it is something that, um, you know, as customers kind of adopt more uh, a diverse compute infrastructure that, that we get asked about a lot and, uh, you know, very open to figuring out how we can do more in that area. So, yeah, great, thanks. You're welcome. Hi, um, so I've got a couple of questions. Um, we're looking at probably fairly aggressively trying to move towards 4.x mostly driven by Knative, because we've got a lot of developers who are using OpenShift who are very interested in the kind of function as a service um, paradigm. Uh, at the moment with our three clusters, we run um, stretch architecture. So we use AWS as well as bare metal on-prem. The control plane's one side of the one link. We don't stretch that. I get those would be two different machine sets. In 4.1, is, there, is that going to be like a supported deployment where we'll be able to actually deploy bare metal and EC2 instances and have them part of the same cluster? Or is that something that you're intending them to be separate clusters at the moment? So generally our guidance is, is latency between control plane and masters is a key thing. And obviously anytime you mix infrastructure, um, that can be very complicated. I think EC2 and metal is going to be fairly complicated. And it, yeah, we keep the control plane one side of the link. We don't stretch the control yeah. plane. And, and I think, um, you know, we we have support for RHEL 7 worker nodes, um, not just RHEL Core OS worker nodes. Um, there may be configurations that make sense. I think it'd be probably a little early to say there might be some assumptions that um, mm -hmm. you might want to investigate before um, jumping whole hog into that. So. Right. Okay. But generally, if you're limiting it to the worker nodes, then you're safe. It's, it's when you start... Because it's stretching the control plane that we really yeah, no, that's don't recommend that. and can't really guarantee. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> yeah. no that's, that's foolish. We wouldn't do that. Just, just yeah, out of curiosity. Add, if, oh, I'm to, sorry, Catherine. I was going to say to add what um, Clayton said, it, it, he kind of hit on it, was with um, the case of RHEL 7. You know, you could have a cluster in AWS, for instance, and then add a RHEL 7 node and try it out. I mean, I don't know that anyone's stretched it that far, especially for worker nodes, but it might be something that you could try very quickly. It okay. shouldn't be a lot of work. If we do that, uh, this is probably a more detailed question, but I, I guess then I'm assuming things like the auto-scaling operator are going to not work. Cause yeah, they, they I'm won't, they they won't understand, yeah, they won't so, understand the bare metal, how to provision actual bare metal machines, right? I, they would in the AWS environment because there's a machine API that'll know how to do that, but okay. it's not in the, in the, in the bare metal side. Just that's good to know. The, the one question I have is, and I guess it's, it's a complicated scenario, so that's probably why we're excited to ask questions, but um, I assume you, you're, you treat, if, if you run your control plane in the bare metal environment and you burst out to EC2, I assume you have, you've turned off all cloud integration points, right? So, okay. So I, I think understanding some of those nuances it would be good feedback to the team here, and then, but I don't want to give you an answer of yes, it would work great or no. No, okay, fair enough. Um, and I guess the, the second question, um, was thinking about the, the three to four migration. I'm, I'm a little familiar with Valera, not deeply, but um, we obviously, it's great for stateless stuff, but we've got things like OpenShift container storage that are hosting PVCs, that are hosting the Docker registry. What, what, what's the story on sort of stateful pieces? Again, we're going to show a demo tomorrow, but we're looking at several, the, the idea is to give our customers choice. So there's a choice to copy and replicate, there's a choice to swing the PVs or move the PVs to point to the new control plane. Um, and the idea is that you know your architecture better than anyone and you will see what are the options that Red Hat gives you and choose the best, the best path. Okay, but there is some optionality around persistent yeah. volume movement. Correct. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. I uh, also wanted to add a little context on 
folks mentioned uh, bringing your own RHEL nodes and so forth. So when you're looking at the OpenShift installer and if you've been in the beta, you're, you're looking at like the, right now uh, for AWS, a fully installer provisioned uh, mode, right? Where the right. installer is taking care of everything from configuring the infrastructure to bootstrapping uh, all the core OS nodes for the masters and the workers to then setting up Kubernetes and everything that comes on top. Right. Um, that's not always possible. Um, so we do have a mode uh, that sort of user provisioned or combines user and infra installer provision uh, so that you can do things like set up the, the cloud infrastructure yourself if you're you know in a lockdown environment or an environment where you're not able to delegate that control to the installer mm -hmm. or uh, bring your own uh, rel nodes as was mentioned if you're uh, in an environment for whatever reason you want to continue managing the operating system outside of OpenShift or you want to uh, kind of have a traditional RPM based uh, set of uh, components, you can do that. Um, the VMware and uh, bare metal providers that uh, Tracy mentioned that came out in beta four, those are what are called user provisioned, meaning um, you configure the infrastructure, uh, the, the underlying infrastructure yourself, and then uh, we uh, automate the deployment of Kubernetes and operators on top of that. Okay. Um, but we are working with VMware, as you heard this morning, on a full installer provision mode where, where th those choices are made for you. It's fully automated from the configuration of vSAN and networking and everything else above. Um, and uh, what you'll see in the keynote tomorrow is we're working on a full installer provision mode for bare metal, which will be very cool to, to automate. Yeah everything that has to do with boot, bootstrapping a bare metal cluster and configuring and so forth. So. Yeah, the one thing to add to that, um, Joe, you, you had it almost all perfect, except for the uh, AWS for user provision. Oh, that's so, right, yeah, that's so right. So we're, <laughs> we're gonna actually have a mode, I know this has come up, um, probably a few people in the room has come up about uh, customizing the AWS infrastructure. So we're, we have a mode where it'll take pre-existing infrastructure and you'll be able to do an, uh, an OpenShift deployment to that. So that's one of the things that will be part of uh, 4.1. Yeah. yeah, so I'll put the plug out there again. I was waiting for my time. Try.openshift.com, there is two different sections. Please go out and look, it's brand new as of Friday. You have an uh, install on premise or install with options that Catherine mentioned, or the, nor the usual install flow that you guys have seen up on Try.openshift for a few months now with um, yeah. Installer provisioned. It's also a plug for our betas. Like, you know, your feedback is really valuable, right? And so for us, we look at it and like, Amazon, we can automate everything. Let's do that, right? And then we go to select customers in the beta and say, no, you know, our Amazon environment is very locked down and I don't have the authority to delegate control of whatever DNS or VPCs or whatever to you. Um, and so that's how the, in, you know, the user provisioned mode for AWS was born. Um, right. And it's feedback like that that you know, is just invaluable to us to, to continue making sure that the product suits your needs. So. Thank you very much. Um, I have two questions. <laughs> um, so we're currently using 3.11 with a cluster CNS storage, mm -hmm. and we heard that uh, there is no roadmap for cluster probably in four. Uh, just want to confirm on that size, you know, what's going to be our strategy? How do we get off of that when you go to yeah. four? So, so OpenShift container storage in 3x was built around the cluster technology, and that's going to that's got a life cycle that goes out into. 2020 something, <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, if you're on that infrastructure, you know that is, uh, you know, fully supported by Red Hat patches, updates, the whole nine yards. Um, as we move to 4.x, um, you know, we had a, a just like we had a number of architectural choices on OpenShift, we also had architectural choices on on storage. One of the things that we saw was um, a lot more demand for object storage. Um, and we also saw a lot of momentum uh, in the community around a project called Rook, right? So generally in our portfolio, object storage really is more, you know, uh, closer to Ceph and what we, you know, what we, um, what we see as the strengths of Ceph. Uh, obviously Ceph also does block and uh, even file through CephFS. Um, and the Rook project, um, we already had Red Hat folks contributing to it and so forth. So OpenShift container storage in 4X is going to be uh, built around uh, the Rook and, uh, and Ceph technology. Um, and then just like you know, three to four migration, we're, we're working on storage migration. Cheyenne, why don't you stand up, is the product management lead for, um, for OpenShift container storage. Yeah, I want to give Cheyenne the mic. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, yeah, good question. So, um, uh, OpenShift, uh, and it's going to be in a roadmap session tomorrow at 10.30 if you're joining. So, the, the technology stack for OCS 4.x is going to be based on Rook Yosef and actually Nuba, which is our uh, latest acquisition in storage space for multi-hybrid cloud capabilities. So, it's not just Rook and Ceph, but also Nuba. So, if you want to know more about it, you can come to the session tomorrow. It's room 161. Great. And I know it's hard, it's booked, so I tried for it, but. Uh, yeah. All right, so again, all sessions will be recorded, and obviously um, uh, there's also the opportunity to meet with folks like Cheyenne here or a after the conference if you want like a demo. If you, if you couldn't get into a session or you, want, you liked what you saw in a session but you want a demo for your broader team or discussion, uh, just reach out to your account teams and we can, we can set that up and, and okay. everybody's happy to talk to you. <laughs> okay, and the other question is about the licensing. Uh, it used to be socket-based and, and heard it, it's going to be core-based with the 4.x, oh, core-based core for worker notes, is that correct? So, uh, so basically, the, we did, uh, we do uh, support, we supported both sockets and cores for the worker nodes from the beginning. Um, we moved to focusing on core based because it gives us an option that works across all environments, right? Like you can't really count sockets on Amazon and so forth. Um, that being said, um, if you're an existing customer that you know is on a socket based uh, program, um, there is sort of a grandfathering or renewal so, so you can kind of continue that. Um, at least for one renewal term, and then you know, talk to your sales reps around, around the rest. Um, and then there's options like uh, cloud suites, like some bundles that, that are, are socket-based. But yeah, we want to kind of um, simplify the pricing structure, um, also get out of discussions around um, what the right ratio is from cores to sockets, which is, you know, you should see your procurement people love <laughs> talking to us about that. So we just wanted to kind of simplify that, but that, that's kind of the, the, the focus now is on uh, core vCPU based pricing. Uh, the other thing is we're actually, with the metering technology, uh, finally going to uh, be able to offer, uh, you know, hopefully later this year, a consumption-based model for, um, for, you know, for if you have like a base set of capabilities, but you want to burst uh, capacity, so we're looking at how to tie uh, the metering uh, to offer more consumption-based pricing options. Oh, so Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, two questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so there was a comment about automating vSAN integration. Is there a story around read-write-many, or is that still going to be uh, something that's more manually provisioned? Uh, <laughs> Eric? <laughs> Sorry, there's not a uh, new story in that area. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, the other question is, with all of these new features and all of these new processes and technologies building blocks, uh, what about training? For those of us, for example, with access to the Red Hat uh, you know, training catalog, mm -hmm. when can we expect that to be updated? Yeah, so great news. So the, the, the Red Hat um, the training team has already been hard at work, uh, starting with the first beta on uh, uh, building training curriculums for OpenShift 4, both for um, for administrators as well as for developers, although from a developer's perspective, it's the same thing other than there'll be trainings for things like Istio and Knative and the new stuff, but in terms of how developers work with OpenShift, um, that should be consistent. So yeah, so I think um, uh, look forward to that, and I, there may be some sessions. That I know the, the Global Learning Services team is here at Summit. Uh, you can go talk to them about that. Um, if you have a, a GLS, you know, all-you-can-eat subscription, that's great because you get access to the whole catalog. And then we also have other options. Uh, Brian mentioned learn.openshift.com, a great resource, um, you know, for f folks who are just getting started and want to um, actually do something hands-on and self-paced. There's a lot of learning modules, and we keep adding new ones. A lot of them are tied to new technologies like Knative and Istio. Um, uh, number of books and community resources, the, the commons gatherings uh, events and the weekly briefings are a great, great way to learn about new technology. So, uh, so for those of us with the learning subscriptions, you'd expect that to be updated relatively short Yeah, I, th I think um, if, it, if those courses aren't available right when the GA uh, hits in a, a couple weeks, um, it, it won't be uh, very, you know, very long after that because they've been developing all along with us. Yeah, I think the, the plan is instructor-led will we'll go right around GA and then the self-paced stuff will come shortly thereafter. Excellent, thank you. I'll go back to your read write many question. I don't know where Cheyenne is and why he's not yelling at me. But uh, <laughs> if, if my answer was accurate, I guess, if you're trying to just use the vSphere provided functionality, but if you have OCS, 
uh, read write many would be something that could be automated and supported and that can run on top of right anywhere you want to run it so okay. there is a story but the specific question I think you were asking it's sort of manual right and I'll table all of my questions around that <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you yeah all right well thank you everybody we appreciate your participation we appreciate your questions uh, now that you know what everybody looks like feel free to corner these folks <laughs> in the hallways and throughout the week and uh, thanks again